Uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I like to say after one of these introductions, uh, my reputation exceeds me. <laughs> so, uh, and in keeping with that thread, I'll say I like to start my talks with a quote because as Oscar Wilde noted, uh, quotation is a serviceable substitute for wit. <laughs> uh, the quote I'm going to start you with is uh, one of my favorites. It's from Edwin Schlossberg who said, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. And a lot of what I've done in my career has been to frame things in such a way that people can see what's important about them. And what I'm going to try to do today is to uh, look at a couple of interesting startups or, or projects and pull out some of the things that I find interesting about them as a way of giving you some perspective both on technology but also on uh, values and uh, business strategy. Uh, so the, the, the company that I really want to talk about the most right now is Square. Uh, and Square is interesting for a, a number of reasons, but I want to just ask how many of you uh, have actually uh, shopped in a store that has a Square cash register? So for a fair number of you. How many of you had the Square Wallet app running when you did that? Smaller number of you. I really recommend it. It's pretty weird when you walk into the store and they say, are you Tim O'Reilly? You know, obviously, the clerks need a little retraining because, of course, uh, they should be asking you, what's your name, you know, so that you have to provide it, and then you get two-factor authentication. Instead, they're just looking at your name <laughs> on the cash register and you know, your face. And, but still, you look like yourself. You're, you're probably OK. But there are a number of wonderful things, lessons, in this app. And I want to sort of tease them apart. Um, the, the first one is to do less. You know, we hear a lot in the mobile world about how it's a small screen. We hear about how people use mobile devices differently. But there's something that's incredibly important that's going on in mobile that I think we're just beginning to understand. And that is that your mobile device knows so much that you don't have to tell it as much as you used to. You know, I'm an investor in Foursquare, but I still think, how stupid is it that I have to check in somewhere? I mean, my phone already knows I'm there. I'm an investor in RunKeeper. But I say, why do I have to tell my phone that I started running? It knows I started running. It knows when I stopped. And one of the things that I love about Square is that Jack has exploited this. You know, when you show up in that store, uh, you know, you're, you're, if you're running the Square Wallet app, your identity is broadcast to any Square cash registers. Now, if you talk to a merchant, you'll say, oh, yeah, sometimes we get people who are in the next door over. It's not like a real check-in. <laughs> but the fact is, you know, Jack figured out, I don't actually have to ask the user to tell uh, you know, me that they're there. The phone tells the cash register that it's in the vicinity without any human intervention, other than starting the app and running it in the background. Now, there may be some battery issues with that and so on. But you know, think about that as a trend and a theme that you've got to come to grips with in designing apps. You know, we now have devices that have so much information, so much implicit context. And there's going to be, I think, a revolution as we take away more and more of the instructions that we give to the device and realize, oh, wait, we can just assume that. So first lesson. Uh, second lesson, uh, of course, from Square is uh, that you have to embrace hardware as well as software. Uh, Brad Feld, uh, who is a technology investor from Colorado, made a uh, humorous comment at our uh, Make Hardware Innovation Summit last year which sounded very retro until you thought about it. He said, I'm not interested in investing in software anymore. I'm only interested in investing in software if it's wrapped in plastic, you know, which made you think he was referring to shrink wrap software. But no, no, he was referring to you know, that somebody had figured out some maker element to, to you know, whether it's you know, Fitbit or Square or whatever. But there was a clever bit of hardware hackery that Square used up front uh, to bootstrap its business, to make a phone into a credit card reader. You know, that thing actually listens, uh, you know, actually uses the, the audio jack for, for input to the device. Very, very clever bit of, of hardware hackery, and there's no power in the thing. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, of, of maker smarts in that device, as well as software smarts. Um, 
The third lesson that you see in Square uh, is the notion of software above the level of a single device. You know, we're so used to thinking of, uh, you know, the, the software as being what's running here. Now, we've been in this transition really for, um, you know, decade, decade and a half. And we're just getting deeper and deeper and deeper into understanding what this means. The line, software above the level of a single device, actually came from Dave Stutz's uh, parting letter to Microsoft when he resigned. It must have been about 2003 or 2004. Uh, and he said, stop looking over your shoulder. You know, there's plenty of money to be made building software above the level of a single device. The name, the term stuck with me uh, because at the time I was giving a series of talks uh, called the Open Source Paradigm Shift. And it was really about the real implications of Linux. Because everybody was still at that time thinking, oh wait, Linux is in competition with Windows. And I was like, no, no, you guys are missing the point. And I would ask audiences, I'd say, how many of you in the audience uh, use Linux? And I'd get a show of hands, you know, depending on where I was talking, you know, very many or very few. And then I would say, well, how many of you use Google? And every hand in the room would go up. And I said, well, then you use Linux. It's just not on the computer in front of you. You know, and, and so trying to get across the notion that the computer that was in front of you was not the only one. But what's really interesting is that we're starting to see with applications like Square, literally someone has designed a system that, you know, is in the space between these devices, between the app in your pocket and the cash register app on the, uh, at the front desk of the coffee shop or the local merchant. And that notion is, again, something that I think we're going to be seeing more and more as a design pattern. How do you think through you know, a whole set of interactions between users uh, who might be on different devices? And you know, obviously, there's a software back end uh, that has that credit card information, that has that picture. You know, when you're, when you're there, there's a lot going on there, and it's a system. It's not just a single application. So, um, you know, uh, fourth lesson, uh, harness network effects in data. You know, this was uh, the heart of, you know, my thinking that came out of that open source activism uh, was when I realized that, um, uh, you know, it was actually something Clay Christensen called the law of conservation of attractive profits. I realized that open source software and open protocols of the internet were going to make software as it was less valuable and something else would become valuable when that became commoditized. And I came to the conclusion it was data. And you know, so that was really what distinguished companies like Google or for that matter Amazon uh, from the previous generation of software companies. And, uh, but, you know, this is a key part of Square as well. I remember when I first uh, talked to Jack about the application, he was saying, well, we're going to use, you know, people's social network to help with credit scoring. Uh, and obviously, they're retaining data in the, in, in, in the form of people's credit card information, uh, their pictures, all these kinds of things that are re required. And that application really is going to get better and stronger the more people are part of, of the network. So network effects in data. Uh, is, is a critical piece, again, of what makes Square a really interesting and paradigmatic app. Um, you know, uh, the, the fifth lesson that I take from Square is to rethink workflows and the experience that someone has. You know, again, you know, so many apps, you know, that experience is this. You know, that's not a very interesting experience. Uh, you know, the experience of walking up to a, you know, a, a storefront and talking with a person with, while the devices are doing this work in the background is a complete rethinking of that, of that workflow. Uh, but another place where you see this, also in a retail context, is in the Apple Store. I mean, how amazing is the Apple Store? You go into a typical retailer, you can't find a salesperson to save your life. You know? And instead, you know, what Apple has done is they've given all these, uh, uh, they, they, they've taken that cash register workflow and totally decomposed it so that everybody who works for Apple in the store can check you out. Uh, they can check inventory. They've turned them into augmented humans with superpowers. You know, so you have, instead of no clerks, you know, here's automation you know, creating more clerks. 
and making it an extraordinarily profitable uh, store. And I think this model um, can be applied in other areas. I was in a brainstorming session run by the Markle Foundation with Todd Park, who's the federal CTO. He was at the time CTO of the Department of Health and Human Services. And he was talking about how Walgreens is trying to do this for pharm pharmacy assistants, where they're trying to get them uh, you know, to be able to be more helpful to people because they have access via a phone to um, you know, the database that will basically make maybe a, a home health assistant uh, somebody who has superpowers. You know, rather than this being a low-level job, it becomes a high-level job when you give that person access to the machine. Uh, and I think this is really perhaps one of the most interesting things about Google Glass is it will allow uh, more of these kinds of workflow innovations where you know, people are going to be able to be connected to computers in more powerful ways in a professional setting. You know, so it, a lot of people say, well, wow, will this be weird? They think about all the consumer applications. But there's a huge set of applications in purely professional settings where you're really going to be able to rethink the workflow, how somebody does their job because they have access to a computer in a different way. Um, so there's another lesson that's sort of implied in all of, of those uh, just last examples, which is really to think differently about man-machine symbiosis. You know, one of the key ideas that uh, I had when I was sort of promulgating the idea of Web 2.0 was that it was about harnessing collective intelligence. The, the, what distinguished the apps that survived the dot-com bust from those that didn't was that uh, you know, companies like Google and Amazon uh, were really good at figuring out how to get their users to contribute to what they did. Uh, and, you know, and I could go into that in, in great detail. But over the last decade, we found more and more interesting ways to do that. And uh, there was a wonderful paper by J.C.R. Licklider written in 1960 called uh, Man-Machine Symbiosis. Uh, I updated it to call it Human-Machine Symbiosis, but since we uh, are not quite so sexist now, although we still have a long way to go. Um, uh, but uh, you know, he, he was just talking about this possibility of you know, connecting humans and computers in new ways. And so, uh, um, you know, a really great example of this that I can't, you know, pass by is the, the uh, Google Autonomous, you know, car. What I find so fascinating about this project is that, uh, you know, in 2005 it was, we had the DARPA Grand Challenge and the winner went seven miles in seven hours. You know, six years later, Google says, oh, we have a car that's driven hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic. What happened? What was different? And there was a wonderful line from uh, Peter Norvig. He said, we don't have better algorithms. We just have more data. And what was that data? It turns out it was the Google Street View vehicle. So the difference is the recorded memory of humans who drove those roads. You equip humans with sensors, very, very detailed sensors that measured everything, that photographed everything collected all that data, stored it in the global brain, and then you know, returned it uh, you know, for use by that car. That's a brilliant you know, rethinking of man-machine symbiosis, human-machine uh, symbiosis. Um, there's similar examples in robotic surgery. Uh, but you know, really fascinating. Peter uh, made the comment, uh, it's, you know, it's a fairly hard AI problem to pick a traffic light out of a video stream. It's a trivial AI problem to figure out if it's red or green if you already know that it's there. And that's really one of the, one of the key insights that uh, went into uh, that vehicle. And again, so that's something you ought to think about. So, but back on this notion of, um, since we're on the subject of cars, uh, you know, another application that you know, puts a bunch of these principles into work, you know, softer above the level of a single device, uh, is Uber and rethinking workflows. Uh, you know, think about that wonderful experience. You've got a phone, it knows where you are. The driver's got a phone, it knows where he is or she is. And then Uber has this uh, you know, memory, this brain, which is identifying that, routing, telling everybody how to get together. That's a system. It's softer above the single level of a single device. Uh, it's providing a whole lot of context without you having to uh, do a whole lot, you know, when you, when you first 
checking it. it. Uber does a decent job of figuring out where you are. Maybe you have to correct it a little bit. Uh, they've done a pretty good job of applying these principles. But there's another principle that Uber uh, uh, brings up, uh, kind of a really interesting thing. You know, when you use Uber, you're asked to rate the driver. The driver is also asked to rate you as a passenger. Now that's a really, really interesting uh, thing. And Uber is pretty ruthless about weeding out people who uh, get bad marks from their passengers. Now you think about your experience of, if, if, how many people here have actually driven in an Uber? Fair, fair number, you. pretty good experience, isn't it? It's kind of one of those magical things like going into you know, a Square-enabled coffee shop or going into an Apple store, you go, whoa, this is really good. You know, and you compare that to your experience with a, with a cab driver. You, know, you have you know, the guys uh, you know, playing loud music, he doesn't know where he's going, uh, you know, all kinds of terrible experiences. You, know, you get an Uber driver does that, they're out on their ear. And you think about the old school way that uh, you know, taxi cabs are regulated. Well, we're gonna test people, we're gonna figure out who's approved to do this. You know, Uber has actually done one better. You know, there may be some <laughs> regulatory issues there that need attention, but there's a lot of ways that we're starting to see reputation systems that we've seen on internet uh, applications start to have uh, relevance in the real world. And I think that's, I, I, I'm not putting that as a principle, I'm just asking it as a question. I think it's, it's one of the great interesting unanswered questions in, in the government area. Uh, but the, the, the lessons, uh, my, my next lesson that I really wanted to highlight from Uber is to close the loop. You know, what makes that Uber experience so different is that you know when your cab is going to arrive. <laughs> you know, when, when you, let's say you want to go to the airport and you call a cab, you never know, are they gonna show up? Are they close? Uh, you know, did they forget? Uh, you know, you're standing on a street corner in the rain. You don't know how long it's going to be. Think about Uber. You know, you can sit in the restaurant. You can sit in the coffee shop. You get a text when the driver is outside. You know, Uber has closed the loop. Uh, you want to know where they are? You can actually look on the map and you can watch their progress towards your location. You know, Uber has you know, closed the loop. And I got that framing from Chris Saka, who's an early investor. Uh, in Uber. Uh, he was also Google's head of special projects for a long time. And he said, what I learned from Google is to only invest in things that close the loop. And I think that's a really, really important principle. And if you're doing a startup, think about what loops you can change. You know, that's another you know, piece of, uh, you know, how, how do you make things smarter so that, that uh, you, you, don't, you don't have these open-ended uh, systems where you don't really know what you're going to get. So, um, but I want to return a little bit to Square for my next lesson, which is uh, a slogan that we've used a lot at O'Reilly, uh, create more value than you capture. You know, think about it. When, when Jack first started Square, he had a social mission in mind. He wanted to enable a class of small merchant who he felt was disadvantaged, who couldn't take credit cards. He wanted to enable uh, anybody uh, to, to, to exchange money in a new way. Uh, he was thinking hard about how do you actually make the economy work better? That's you know, a big interesting question and one that uh, I think we, we miss a lot. We have a lot of startups that all they're really thinking about is uh, you know, how do I get a startup that will get funded uh, and get me to an exit? You know, and maybe you think, well, I have an interesting problem. But uh, you know, this is the kind of thing, you know, my sense was that Jack wanted to solve that problem whether you know, it turned into a big business or not. He just thought it was really, really interesting to solve. And, but there's also this sort of sense of trying to enable an economy that feels really important. And there's this quote that I love from Les Miserables. Uh, and uh, it, it's sort of wonderful. I, I, how, many people, uh, did you, how many people saw the movie? Uh, okay, I've seen the play, whatever. How many people read the book? Even better. Uh, the book is absolutely wonderful. Probably my favorite novel of all time. Um, but uh, the, 
Yeah, the, the story, for those of you who don't know, is the guy who was a, 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 pr a prisoner for many years. He was in prison for stealing a loaf of bread. You know, like so many people in our prison system, he, uh, he, you know, he's kind of he's ruined by this. He becomes a, sort of a, a criminal. He gets out. He can't get a job because he's branded as a criminal. He ends up uh, stealing some candlesticks from a, a, a church that takes him in. And the Abbe there, instead of turning him into the police, when the police come around, he says, oh, no, I gave them to him. And so Jean Valjean becomes, he sort of feels like he he's, uh, has an obligation to do good after this. And he goes and he becomes a businessman. And he creates this wonderful, you know, this factory where he, he builds this wonderful business. And this is the line that I love so much. Uh, he, he makes the entire region prosperous. So there was no pocket so obscure that it had not a little money in it. No dwelling so lowly that there was not some little joy within it. And here's this key point, Father Madeline, he's living under a pseudonym because he was an escaped con. He said, Father Madeline made his fortune, but a singular thing in a simple man of business it did not seem as though that were his chief care. He appeared to be thinking much of others and little of himself. Now, you know, you think about how many people in business that you could say that of. Uh, there are not that many. And that's something really wrong with that. Uh, and I think it really uh, started with... Um, you know, this idea which came out in the 80s that the only obligation of a business is to make money for its shareholders. We've seen where that has taken us, you know, to a situation where the Wall Street banks can think it's perfectly legitimate to s screw over the entire economy as long as it fattens their profits. This is not okay. It's the big lie of modern business. You have an obligation if you're in business to create value. And that's one of the, the, the lines that I use all the time is, that we should create more value than we capture. But this idea that Jack had, that he wanted to build something that helped the economy, that helped the small uh, business. And you see this in, in Etsy. You see it in Airbnb. They want to figure out how to make an economy. They want pe other people to succeed as a result of this. You see it in Kickstarter, obviously. So um, these are, are really uh, important lessons. You know, if you're creating an ecosystem, if you're creating value for other people, your business will succeed. You know, I, I you know, um, didn't coin that line. We made a motto uh, for O'Reilly. It was actually a guy named Brian Irwin, who was at the time my VP of marketing. We had a, a, um, a management retreat. This is back 10, 12 years ago. And we were just talking about sort of key principles at O'Reilly. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, some number of, of internet billionaires who said, oh, yeah, it all started with an O'Reilly book. And I laughed and I said, yeah, I got, uh, and I got 30 bucks for it, you know. <laughs> uh, and and uh, he said, yeah, that's one of, our, one of our guiding principles, create more value than you capture. And I've loved it ever since because it's such a great idea. You know, if you can make other people successful, if you can do what Father Madeline did in, in uh, uh, Les Miserables, you can make the world a better place. Uh, you're really uh, you know, doing a good thing. Uh, so no, uh, that kind of another way of saying the same thing would be uh, this other principle that I have, which is simply to work on stuff that matters. And um, we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but I want to lead up to a, another principle just by reflecting very briefly on some of the things I've been associated with. Open source movement, Web 2.0, the maker movement, open data, open government. These are all, in a lot of ways, things that matter. But they're also big ideas that told a story. And that is what I, I wanted to, to come to is this as a tenth principle for you, which is idealism is not only good for your business, not only good for the world, it's the best marketing. You know, when we uh, started working on the open source movement, it was because we said, hey, this is really important thing that nobody's paying attention to it. But we sold a lot of books because we told a big story that mattered to all those communities, that we made them proud of who they were, that we made the world know who they were. And it was great marketing for us. It was great because we were helping others and we helped our own business. Web 2.0, a lot of people don't realize this, but the reason why we started that marketing campaign was because after the dot-com bust, a lot of our customers were out of work and we actually had our strategic goal in 2003 to reignite enthusiasm in the computer business. We basically, we went out there and we, we told a big story that was designed to help other people. 
And it, sure, it, it helped us build our business as well. Uh, you know, clearly I've been doing that in areas like open government. Uh, I'm looking at healthcare. I'm really interested in that. Uh, but there's another element of that idealism that I want to share. And I want to start with a, a, a talk I gave in 2008 called Why I Love Hackers. And uh, it was at our Emerging Technologies Conference. And in that talk, I gave, uh, I read a poem. And you can't really see in the background. It's, it's a painting by uh, uh, Delacroix in the background of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's a biblical story. Uh, and the poem uh, by Rilke is, is about you know, how the, the wrestlers of the Old Testament would go wrestle with the angel. And they knew they couldn't win. But they got stronger by wrestling with the angel. And, and this wonderful line from Rilke, he says, what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small. What we want is to be defeated decisively by successively greater beings. And, and I love that. And I, I said, so I told this. And it was funny because the reaction from the audience, I told, people love to be challenged with idealism. They love to be challenged to do stuff that matters. And so in the last, you know, ever since I gave that talk, I've really just been focusing on that. Just like, I don't care what you do. Do something that matters to you more than money. Now, that's a great way to succeed. But even if you don't succeed, the world will be in a better place. And, and that's what you should think of as an entrepreneur. And you should think about working on things that are hard. Remember that what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small. You know, find hard problems. I was thinking of a, a, a great example of this. Uh, you know, this uh, my son-in-law had started a company called uh, Makani Power, which um, does high altitude wind energy. And one of the things that, uh, first of all, really hard problem, but it, what really stuck in my mind was a guy who quit a hedge fund uh, to come work for Makani. It's basically pretty hard. You're basically controlling you know, a flying drone that is generating power. It has to be able to fly autonomously for you know, years at a time you know, or, or else you know, come up and down at least uh, in a very controlled way. Um, but the guy said, uh, you know, I, I, I quit working in the hedge fund to come work here because the math is harder. You know, and, and, and that spirit, that spirit of somebody who says, I want to come work on a hard problem. I don't want to work on stuff that's easy. That's one that I find really exciting. And, and uh, you know, working on stuff that matters may mean doing a startup like Makani. It can also do mean nonprofit uh, kinds of things. I've been very involved with, a, with an organization called Code for America, which tries to get people like you to go give a year of service working with city governments. Uh, working to, to make better interfaces for government. I think government's a really important part of our economy, important part of our society. It's clearly broken. Uh, we need to take responsibility for fixing it. Code for America is doing a lot of that. One of the projects that we're working on this year uh, was designed, uh, described by this woman, Ann Milgram, as moneyballing criminal justice. Turns out that uh, one of the biggest costs for cities is pretrial incarceration. This is, uh, you know, sort of um, prison industrial complex, which profits from keeping people in jail. Uh, cities are really kind of stuck here because there's all this fear mongering. Who can you let out? And the bail system is really broken. It was originally designed to let out the petty criminals, keep the big guys, you know, behind bars. But of course, the big guys are profitable enough that the bail bondsmen will put up a bond for them. The little guys can't come up with the $500 bail, and they end up rotting in jail. Uh, Turns out you're more likely to be, actually be sent to jail if you uh, come in to, to your court appearance as a prisoner than if you come in from the outside. You lose your job because you're held. All these kinds of things. And in fact, many of these people could be released on their own recognizance. Uh, this group called the Arnold Foundation has built a data model that actually helps to predict who's safe to let out. And uh, you know, the project that we're doing in New York City and Louisville is actually to apply that data model, build an app for judges, and we'll see how that works. But the story that I wanted to share, uh, the fellows just were out there, and they were in Louisville. And the Louisville fellows, as part of their, uh, you know, they kind of go to the city, they study the problem. They got booked into jail. And uh, this is a you know, really amazing story. Uh, they're they're you know, being escorted to their cell, because they've kind of gone through the whole process. And some prisoner calls out. Hey, warden, who, you know, who are your new friends? You know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, she says, uh, you know, these are the Code for America fellows. And the guy is a young prisoner. He says, oh my god, it's the Code for America fellows. They're here to fix it. 
they're here to fix this. And it's like, boy, what a burden. You know, it's like, oh, they're kind of like, oh, crap. Are we going to be able to do that? But the fact that, you know, and he started telling them all the things that had gone wrong during his, you know, that's so powerful when you can have that impact. You know, there's so many problems where you have impact on people's lives. So anyway, if any of you are interested, go to codeforamerica.org and look for the fellows application. There's also something called the White House uh, Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is trying to do the same kind of thing at the uh, federal level where they're looking for talented people to come uh, work on, uh, on, on problems of government. Uh, so they're also in their application cycle right now. Finally, I, I just I think there's a lot of huge opportunities in healthcare, but there's also startup opportunities. Jen Polka, uh, who founded Code for America, uh, wrote a really wonderful post on LinkedIn recently about a startup idea that the two of us have batted around for a long time, which is, you know, how would you enable the the small corner store? Uh, with logistics, with whatever, to, to basically give them some of the same buying power as a Walmart, uh, predictive analytics about what people will buy. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things you could do to reinvigorate and reinvent the corner store. Kind of social business, but also big business opportunity. So uh, with that, since this is, uh, I'm going to end with a little bit of self-promotion in addition to doing O'Reilly Media and uh, a variety of associated businesses. We do have a, an early stage venture firm. O'Reilly uh, Alpha Tech Ventures, OATV.com. And if any of you are interested in uh, doing or, or are doing startups that have that apply the kinds of things I'm talking about here, uh, or uh, and particularly do things that are going to make a big difference in this world, I want to hear from you. So I'm Tim at O'Reilly.com or at Tim O'Reilly on Twitter. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you. All right. I'm thinking very much it's very terrible. And my question is about the US versus honor in the ecosystem. In terms of the internet ecosystem, it feels that uh, each participant grow by themselves. Like uh, Airbnb, Kickstarter, they, based on, they make order based on their platform. So I'm curious, how about the interactive in terms of the rule of the whole ecosystem to make this ecosystem um, to be that better balance, uh, balance between the peers and uh, the other. Between the what and the other? The peers and the other. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, for example, oh, okay, sorry. My point is that each participant in the, in the ecosystem play their game in their own way. Yeah. So how do they how do they interact with each other in terms of the principle of the ecosystem? And uh, is there any party should fully dedicate to build the principles for the whole ecosystem? Well, uh, I guess what I would say, for, let me start by repeating the question uh, it, it, to the extent I understand it. Uh, there's a, uh, a balance when you are uh, building an ecosystem between you know, the central party that is controlling that ecosystem and then the various other players. How do you design the ecosystem as a whole? Uh, and, and, and the question, I, I would just say it's an ongoing process. You think about, for example, the, the web ecosystem, uh, you know, uh, and all the problems we have with web spam, with SEO spam. You know, Google has to work constantly uh, to make sure that they are thinking, okay, how do we improve results? But they can make decisions that say, we're going to favor a certain kind of project over another. We're going to pay attention to certain kinds of signal. Um, we're, we're going to try to give a priority to whatever we think are the best results for users, not the best results for advertisers, for example. And you see this in uh, something like Airbnb, where they have uh, ideas about how they want to support uh, the experience of their uh, providers. You think about uh, it with um, you know, Etsy, where they're favoring small sellers. They're, try they're trying not to encourage you know, big, big players to, to join the ecosystem. Uh, you see it clearly with Kickstarter, where they're funding certain kinds of projects and not others. 
managing an ecosystem, I think, is really, really important. Because companies that don't get that right, uh, I think, lose their edge. eBay was a great example. They started favoring uh, the big sellers, uh, did really well for them for a while, but it took away a lot of the vitality of that ecosystem and, of course, created an opportunity for somebody like Etsy. Uh, but also, and Amazon for that matter. Uh, okay, uh, how about down here? Yeah. Um, so my question is really like around open source business models and I feel like your Red Hat and Amazon <laughs> have proven they're relatively viable. Um, but really like it, it's a question because if my co-founder <laughs> thinks that like open sourcing our platform is completely insane. Um, but I think that it could make a lot of sense if, uh, if it were licensed right and I think my example to him was like, you guys give away your books DRM free, but you still happen to make money on them. And so if there's anything you could speak yep. to like about that. All right, so the question is about uh, open source business models and how you make money uh, when you're giving away your product for free. Let, let me uh, point out a couple of things here. Uh, first, I do think that the biggest open source success stories were not people like Red Hat. They were people who actually built and sold services that used open source. And obviously, there's obvious, a bunch of obvious players, Google, you know, Amazon, uh, yeah, Facebook, Twitter. They're all open source companies that took open source, they used it to deliver a service. But this is an even more direct example, the entire web hosting business. You know, very thin skin of selling DNS as a service, selling WordPress as a service, selling you know, uh, web, you know, selling Apache as a service you know, for a subscription fee. You know? And so there's a pretty clear case where there was an open source business model that was sitting in plain sight that didn't look like the business model of um, you know, a software company. And I think it's really important to look a little sideways. There was a wonderful talk at our open source convention once by a guy named uh, Robert Lefkowitz. That's by the uh, name Rommel. And uh, he, he basically started in with this long conversation about Sharia compliant mortgages, you know, which is you know, under Islam, you can't, you can't uh, loan money. So he said basically that you know, the, the Islamic banks you know, he went through the two or three different ways that they get around this. You know, they, they basically rent you your house for 30 years, and at the end of 30 years, they make a gift of it to you. Uh, you know, and, and so they, he kind of explains this, and then he says, "Okay, so now let me show you the P&L for Borland versus the P&L for Red Hat." And he says, "Look, yeah, you know, the percentages are identical all the way down the line. There's only one difference. This line says uh, licenses, and this line says subscriptions." You know, Sharia compliant mortgage. He basically, Red Hat, it was the same business as Borland. And, uh, you know, so when you think about open source, I think the most important thing to think about is where do you get your business advantage? Now, there are open source business models where you get your business advantage because, hey, I, in, at least in the early days, this is a great way to get my software in, in people's hands. But in the era of cloud, that's actually not really much of an advantage anymore because anybody can get their software in other people's hands. You know? So that's really gone. Uh, you know, that was the, the idea for MySQL and the whole idea of, uh, of dual licensing. You know, we'll, we'll build the market by letting anybody use it, and then we'll, we'll upsell from there. Uh, but today, that, you know, it's probably easier to do that with a cloud app than it is with, with open source. Um, so you have to think, uh, I think, a little bit harder about where you get your business advantage and why you want to open source it. You might want to get contribution uh, from users. I, I don't know anything about your business. Uh, a huge way to do it is, is that there's some other network effect that comes into play uh, as a result of your software. Either you get a network effect because lots and lots of people use it or because it produces data that you are actually going to monetize is another. Um, so there are a lot, of, a lot of answers, but I would just urge you to think sideways and don't get caught in um, open source being a simple variation on a business model where I would have charged, uh, you know, and I would have had a proprietary uh, fee. But um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't know what the right answer is for you. Maybe we can talk more about that later. Okay, let's go up to the back up there. Oh. Hi, my name is Diaz. I'm from Philadelphia. So I'm actually working on 
a project called Code for Philly, which is basically part of Code for America. Yeah. But in the East Coast, we don't really have as big community of hacker and open source people. So my question is, do you have any suggestion to bring, um, to make the community of hacker and open source in Philadelphia better? Um, <laughs> gosh, I, I would have said there's a pretty good open source community in Philadelphia, but you know better than I do. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, I, I, the thing I would say is, find interesting problems that are relevant locally um, and you know work on them work on them publicly uh, talk about them you know this wonderful line uh, that Dave Weiner once said about blogging and its its significance for business which is it's about narrating your work in public so narrate your work in public you know make sure that you tell the story of what you're doing why you're doing it and keep telling that story until you get other people to, to come with you. Now, keep in mind that sometimes it takes a long time. You know, I think of some of the movements that I've been associated with, you know, it, it takes a long time. We launched Make Magazine in 2004, right? And it's only now that, you know, the VCs are all over it. What's that? Eight years, you know? Uh, you know, I started talking about this idea of data and the, you know, trans, you know, the real business model of open source being these uh, sort of network effects and data and what became cloud. Again, I started talking about that in 1997, you know, and, uh, you know, and we were building an internet operating system. I, you know, I get, did a conference called Building the Internet Operating System in 2001. Everybody said, what the hell are you talking about? You know, so just keep at it. Uh, over here. Great. So speaking of stories, can you tell us your story? I mean, you've had a really long and illustrious career doing all these amazing things. Where were you when you were in most of those students in this room? And how did you get from there to here? The short and All right. So don't how, uh, how I became Tim O'Reilly. Um, so my initial, uh, I, I got out of college, and uh, I didn't want to have a job. <laughs> Simple as that. I, I, uh, I had this notion that I wanted to, you know, uh, uh, have interesting work, uh, but I didn't want to be, you know, constrained. I wanted to build kind of lifestyle business, and in some ways, I joked that O'Reilly was just a lifestyle business that got out of control. Um, you know, my initial business, uh, my initial business plan was interesting work for interesting people. Uh, and it was no, no more than that. And what we did originally was a tech writing consulting company, uh, but I started getting asked to write manuals for the same kinds of products, and so I started retaining the rights. You know, these were things like, oh, wow, you want a Fortran manual? We've already got one. You know, we'll sell it to you. And then, and then that turned into the publishing company because we realized that uh, 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 we were originally selling directly to companies. You know, so. Uh, you know, we'd license, effectively, we're a documentation company. We say, okay, you can pay us $25,000 and have it in six weeks instead of $50,000 and have it in six months. Uh, uh, but then we realized that people were more excited to actually buy individual copies. And the big turning point in our business was uh, uh, Sun Microsystems had turned the, us down on a $25,000 license fee for our X Window System, uh, X Lib programming books. And then a year later, they bought a million dollars worth of printed copies of the same books. And we went, oh, OK, wait. <laughs> and, and, but, but again, when, you th when we, we really thought about that, it actually made sense. Because when we sent, sold them a source license, they had to go manufacture you know, tens of thousands of copies of these things. And this is in the day when you know, you'd print out, you know, companies would print out their manuals on a dot matrix printer and put it in a binder. And it cost them the same amount of money as buying the individual copies from us. So it was actually not as crazy as it looked. So again, getting a little deeper, I think, into you know, your, your customers' problems uh, is a really important part of, uh, of, of understanding the business. You know, we launched our conference business because uh, it was really actually because of uh, a Microsoft ad campaign, I think. Uh, it was in uh, 1997 when they were uh, promoting a technology called ActiveX, and they actually had television commercials. And Andrew Shulman, who was a, a, an author who was working for me at the time, had done a lot of books about Microsoft uh, technologies, uh, said that in this particular ad campaign, all of the sort of activate the internet things that they were demonstrating in the, in the ad were done with Perl. 
except for this one little animated taxi cab, which was the ActiveX you know, control. And I was sort of a little, I was sort of pissed off about that. And I, and I decided, and, and, and this came at the same time as the book buyer at Borders had told me uh, that Programming Pearl had been one of the top 100 books in any category at Borders the you know, preceding year. So I went, whoa, and nobody's talking about Pearl. So I'm going to do that. And I launched my you know, Pearl conference really just to promote Pearl. I go, nobody's, it's not getting any respect. It turned into a really good business. So we, then we launched the open source convention and then went from there to realize that organizing conferences was a great way to help promote the technologies and ideas we cared about. You know, um, you know, somewhere along the line, we realized, wow, we could invest in some of these things. So we launched our venture firm. Uh, you know, so we just kind of, um, you know, there was a, probably a, a big turning point for me uh, was around 2000, I think I read uh, the book Built to Last um, by uh, Collins and Champy. And I remember we talked about great companies having big, hairy, audacious goals. And, you know, I sat there and I thought, what, what, am, what ties everything that I do together? And what I wrote down was changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And uh, that helped us realize that we weren't just a publishing company, that we really were about finding interesting people, finding interesting ideas, and amplifying them. And you know, it drives everything from our, you know, the businesses that we're in to the, the marketing that we do. And we, we're always looking uh, for those ideas and those transformations. By the way, uh, a, a book that I would recommend, it's an e-book that I read recently that uh, is really helpful in this regard, is it's by Michael Schrag. Uh, called uh, uh, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? Uh, it's really worth thinking about. Uh, he, he makes the point that uh, really uh, great companies have an idea about transforming the lives of their customers. You know, here are the examples he gives, for example, you know, Henry Ford you know, didn't just invent the assembly line, he invented the driver. You know, he invented the weekend so people would have time to go drive cars. He invent, you know, there are all these ways that he thought about changing, you know, uh, people. And you think about how, uh, you know, the, the, the iPhone isn't just a piece of technology. It, the smartphone has changed who we are. Uh, Google changed who we are. Google didn't just change a search, create a search engine. They created, you know, a population of people who take for granted that they can find anything they need to know. And... That's a really, really powerful idea. And so we, we've been sitting there at O'Reilly trying to think about this and saying, who, who, who are we trying to change? What are we trying to change them into? Because that's another piece of this, this sort of thinking about big ideas. Uh, think, you know, when I say changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators, that people have these important ideas. And I want, uh, I want the world to go in important, new, uh, better directions. And so I look for interesting problems, and I basically try to do a lot of, mostly I do a lot of lazy web stuff to get other people to do all the hard work uh, <laughs> to make the changes that I'd like to see happen. There's actually a wonderful uh, uh, point in, in uh, it was at our Emerging Technology Conference and uh, Quinn Norton wrote a piece, I forget what it was in, and whether it was in Forbes, it was in some, uh, some you know, fairly reputable magazine. She said, I finally understand Tim O'Reilly. If he wanted a jet car, he would, Talk, give a talk about how wonderful jet cars are and how we really need them. You know? <laughs> and it, it was very true because uh, there's so many things that I want to see happen. You know, that's why I threw in that Bodega 2.0 slide of, of Jens. You know, we're kind of like, we want this to happen. You know, let's hope we can inspire some entrepreneur to do it. You know? <laughs> okay, over here. My name is Zach, and my question is, where do you think will the marriage between digital media and uh, online advertising will be going in the next 10 years? Uh, in digital media, where will... Uh, where will the marriage between digital media and online advertising? Okay, the marriage between digital media and online advertising. Well, um, I guess I would say it's not so much a marriage as it is uh, sort of an ongoing affair. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, back in 1994, I wrote, uh, I gave a series of talks and I wrote it down eventually, a paper called uh, uh, Publishing Models for Internet Commerce. And I think we've had this long dalliance with advertising as the primary business model uh, for online. 
and I think we're really starting to realize it's not the only one. Back then I said, I thought that the publishing industry had actually a great deal to teach the internet. That it had lots and lots of business models. Crazy business models. I mean, you know, there's actually a kind of business that harnesses school children to go around and, you know, sell magazine subscriptions. That was Publishers Clearinghouse. Remember those guys? I don't know if they still exist or not. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, this sort of crazy stuff that, that we're, start, we're going to discover. So I think we're going to get way beyond advertising. We're already seeing it. Subscription is you know, really big. And that was one of the reasons you know, when we launched Safari Books Online in 2000. It was like subscription is going to become a really important uh, you know, business model. We should, we should place a bet on it. You know, Pay-per-view. I mean, that's really what downloadable e-books are, are apps. Um, and so I think we're starting to see we now have you know, three or four great business models for internet co uh, content and digital media, you know, pay-per-view, subscription, and advertising. Guess what? They were all there in the print publishing business as well, and I think we're going to see others as well. Uh, okay, let's come in here. So, uh, what's your opinion of the current trend you know, about the open source hardware takes or so-called uh, makers uh, revolution? And can it be can this kind of works be classified as what you're talking about the works which change the workflow of the human computer interaction and uh, for these directions, how can we find the unique value or unique competitive needs uh, of our services or products? Yeah. Um, so let me talk. You know, the question is really, what do I think about the maker movement and uh, you know the opportunities there? And I guess I would say a couple of things. And the first is that the maker movement. Uh, has a lot hidden inside of it. And the first thing you have to look at is uh, the arc of new technologies. Every new technology starts with a maker movement. You know, I mean, the Homebrew Computer Club, uh, the, uh, you know, the early World Wide Web, everybody was rolling their own, right? And it turns into a big business. You know, and, and so it's really important to understand the maker movement, first of all, as a stage of the industry, and uh, you know, and it's, it has this characteristic that as soon as it becomes mainstream, people don't see it as maker anymore. You know, so a great example of this is multi-touch displays. You know, I remember back in 2005, we were showing off at our eTech conference, you know, Danny Hillis's map table, which was you know this giant table he built for the you know the Air Force or the CIA or somebody that you could do all those things on, you know. Uh, and uh, then there was Jeff Hahn, 2006. He's there at, you know, at TED in our eTech conference showing his homebrew multi-touch display, which actually later he turned it into a company and sold to you know, CNN when you see them up there doing that's a, a perceptive pixel display. But frickin' 2007, it turns into a, an iPhone. Nobody thinks of, of multi-touch as a maker thing. It was only two years for, from being a maker thing to being in the hands of millions of people. And I think we're going to see a lot of technologies that were that we call maker now, they'll just be like, hey, that's consumer electronics. So that's the first thing I would say there. Uh, but there are uh, some very, very you know, deep lessons in the maker movement. The first is this notion that I talked about here about how sensors are becoming part of everything and how hardware uh, informs software and how it's going to change the nature of the interfaces uh, when, when you have devices that actually have their own sensorium. Um, so that, that's one. Then, then there's the other big wing, which is you know, manufacturing being uh, perhaps uh, democratized in some profound ways, whether it's through 3D printing or whether it's through you know, low-cost reusable you know, hardware um, platforms or whether it's through access to manufacturing you know, in China. And, uh, and then there's, there's, I guess I would say finally, there's what you know, GE is calling the industrial internet. Uh, which is applying all these principles to really big uh, pieces of equipment. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's a lot going on there, and uh, it will have a massive impact on business it already is. Um, so back there, back there in the middle. Yeah. Um, so I'm a huge fan of what you're doing with Government 2.0. I'd love to know your perspective. Where should people start when creating a conversation with government about other things, you know, new opportunities. 
specifically, I'm from San Diego, and our transit system is broken. Um, I'm curious if, if I were to say start that conversation, what would what does good transit for San Diego look like? Where do you even start that? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know the the question. Again, is uh, when you're working in the open government context, where do you, how do you start? And it, it's, it's, I would say it's, it's hard to know. The way that I've always uh, tried to do it, do whatever I do, is you tell the story of people who are doing things right. And you hope that there's somebody out there listening who says, I want to be like that. You know, so you say, wow, they're doing really great stuff in Portland. Here's what it looks like. They're doing really great stuff over here. Uh, you know, in New York, you know, whatever it might be, wherever it might be, and you try to, you know, talk that up, and and hopefully by you know holding up the torch, you get some moths to come out, you know, <laughs> towards the flame, and then you got them. Uh, so uh, there may be other ways, but they're very labor intensive. Finding the right person in a bureaucratic organization, you know, uh, I, I, what I've tried to do, you know, uh, is simply to, to 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 celebrate success, to talk about you know, what, what the future might look like. And then you, you find the people who care. And uh, you get enough of them, you start to get some attention. But th there are practical things you can do. You know, you, you know, with Code for America, you know, that's actually been a strategy for finding the, you know, the smart people in cities. We have an application process. And we say, you know, we're looking for forward-looking cities who want to engage with us around projects. You know, we're increasingly thinking about you know, particular areas we want to work in. And, and uh, but just take takes time and you know footwork. Uh, there there are a lot there are a lot more civic startups. Uh, my, my friend Ron Bougainame, who's uh, uh, works with us on the Code for America Accelerator, is raising a GovTech fund looking for civic startups. Uh, so there's a lot uh, going on there. Last question. Okay, last question here. Um, you're sitting there in the middle. You've been uh, raising your hand a lot. So. <laughs> Where do you see the future of conferences in the next 10 years, and, and what has been your most delightful experience with Friends of O'Reilly? All right, what do I see as the future of conferences uh, over the next 10 years? Um, I'm not very good at predicting the future, uh, despite what people say. I, I just talk about what's happening in the present that seems interesting to me, and I go by William Gibson's dictum that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Mm -hmm. So what do I see right now about conferences that are super interesting? Well, clearly, you've got to pay attention to the fact that TED has syndicated its conference out into the world. That's hugely interesting. Uh, second, uh, you have to look at the success of uh, something like Foo Camp, which is our original unconference, which was then copied by Bar Camp, which is, again, spread all around the world, the idea of self-organizing conferences where you bring in interesting people and uh, you know, they develop their own program. It's hugely important. Uh, I think there's a, a really interesting thing happening with uh, a kind of festival as opposed to a conference, uh, whether it's Open Co., which John Battelle uh, launched recently, or things like the XOXO Festival for Kickstarter uh, that was done in Portland, um, uh, you know, uh, IO Festival in, in Minneapolis. There's sort of a really interesting, you know, how do you create a community happening rather than just a, a professional conference? Uh, I think people still like to get together. I don't think conferences are going away. I do think that they have to become um, much less sort of talking heads on stage and much more, more interactive. Uh, and certainly, my to the other part, the last part of the question, my own sort of experience with Foo Camp, you know, probably the best. Uh, I can't think of what would be the best move, moment, but I, I will certainly think of, you know, when people, when you bring people together, and they they walk away and they do something as a result of the introduction you made. That's that's a pretty good feeling. Uh, probably, probably the most important thing I would say about my work is uh, the greatest satisfaction I have is uh, giving ideas to people and then seeing them do something with them. So, Wonderful. Thank you. Join me in thanking Tim O'Reilly.